Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salaamu alaykum, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our show. Uh, first of all, we'd like to express our deepest condolences on the anniversary of the Arba'een of Abu Abdullah al-Hussein alayhi salam and his companions and his household. Today we are here with Miss Emily Garthway. Hi, good evening. How do you Hello. do? Lovely to be here. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, first of all, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. And um, I want you to feel completely comfortable and at home. And um, I we're do. just uh, trying to get to know each other better, I guess. So um, let's start it with you. Tell me more about yourself. Um, where did you grow up? So I grew up in Surrey, south, in South England, and I started picking up photography around the age of 17 properly. I actually worked in um, fashion before. Then I did quite a lot of work in India, and then out of the blue was offered this job for Arbaeen uh, in 2017, and that has changed the course of my career. Uh huh. What was the focus of your photography before this? What did you like usually do? I think it's just social documentary, looking at everyday life and trying to get underneath the skin of a country, which is incredibly difficult, I think. And it's something that I will dedicate my career to. Um, the transition from documenting other countries to then applying it to Arbaeen was one of the, the biggest moments for me. It was the culmination of all my experience and uh, spending time with local communities and sharing stories. And it came together for, for that incredible few weeks that I had there. Um, and uh, even though this interview has been done a little early, I know that as it's been aired, I'll be there right now with everyone else. Um, did you travel a lot? before this? Did you go to lots of countries? Yeah, I have incredibly supportive family who have always let me fly and that's so important if you're a photographer. But also as a young woman, um, it was never seen as anything other than wonderful to, to see the world and educate myself and others around me. What did you enjoy most, you think, about your career? T the opportunity to learn. I, didn't, I did a master's but I didn't go to university. And in school, I was quite distracted. So for me, my education- Were you like artistic? Yes, it just wasn't quite suited for me, the school setup. I, I needed freedom. Um, I needed uh, trust. I needed people to trust me to be able to, to do what I loved. And um, I'm very stubborn as well. Uh, so together that works quite well as a photojournalist. So I think it was, um, the, yeah, this was the culmination of all of those experiences. It seems right that I would be documenting something like this. Which part of the world, which parts of the world did you enjoy traveling to the most before this trip? My grandmother, my mother's side of the family grew up in India and worked between Iran and India um, with horses and they had a, a tea farm in northeast India. So I always had a connection to this part of the world. And when my grandmother died, I took, my, I took her ashes to India and scattered them. So uh, faith and spirituality have always played a very big part in my life. And my life has played a big part in my work. I don't separate the two. Um, and I think that was probably the start actually, was examining um, religious spaces and how I could exist within them. Um, and, and to be able to identify with all forms of faith. Mm -hmm. Did you find your trip to India a spiritual one? Did you enjoy that um, scale of spirituality? Did it affect you in any way? Yes, it deeply affected me in the same way that I was deeply affected in Iraq. There's a universality to all of this, and it's so important that people take the time to appreciate other people's beliefs. It's something that we can all feel if we just take a moment. There is no right or wrong way. We can learn so much from each other. I've, I've learned a lot from Christianity, from Hinduism, from Buddhism, from Islam, and I will continue to. And I think it's what we can all teach each other amongst these groups and actually integrate. 
So, um, is it safe to say that you consider yourself to be a spiritual person in any way? Yeah, faith has been something that I have newly explored. I have spoken about it, you know, briefly about my experiences during Arbaeen. Um, it's an undeniably powerful moment for everyone. And the most important feeling for me is the sense that, you know, up to 25 million people are walking with the same mentality in peace and love and in mourning, this doesn't happen anywhere. You know, I always speak about the other side is protest and everyone is mutually feeling angry and frustrated. But there isn't, until this moment in my life, I'd never been in a space where it was love. Everyone felt that's the like same. That, yeah, and I don't know whether that's sense. kind of spoken about enough, how unusual that is for everyone to feel the same way. Mm. How did you come across this whole thing anyway? I was in France mm -hmm. and I got an email in the evening, 8 p.m., from a lovely... Out of the blue. Out of the blue. <laughs> and I get all sorts of funny emails that come into my inbox. And it was an invitation from an Iranian arts institute to present a, a feature-length documentary on Arbaeen. I'd never heard of Arbaeen and I've spoken... You hadn't? Never. And I'd spoken at length with um, people in the UK since over the course of these two years about Arbaeen and no one's heard of it. But people feel ashamed they haven't heard of it. I felt embarrassed because if it's something of that scale, it seems odd to have not heard about it. And I think, you know, it has been discussed at length about the lack of representation in the media. So I Googled it and was fascinated to see how it had been reported. For instance, all of the news articles that relate to Arbaeen are in reference to attacks by Daesh, rather than the positive nature of it, the resilience of people, how it's a message of peace at a time in a post-conflict zone, the collaboration amongst countries, and also the positive nature of Islam. All of this has been removed and not, not covered. So I felt an immense amount of pressure, but also, interestingly, I prepared for what had been presented in front of me. I was nervous. Um, Were I've you always, scared I, in any way? Yes, I was before. The week before I thought I was so, fa I so firmly believed it was going to be different from what I'd seen online that I thought maybe I was being silly. But I just thought 25 million people cannot be walking in anger and aggression, like I'm being told. Um, so my stubborn nature persisted. And with support from my family, you know, my, my mother and father said, go and see it for yourself. We know that you'll, you'll be able to see it calmly and in a considered way. And uh, within the hour of landing. How did that feel the mo first moment? Where did you land, by the way? Was it Baghdad or Najaf? I went via Istanbul. And that's uh -huh. when I first, when Arbaeen first started, because people coming onto the flight were going to Najaf. And there was a British woman there who'd taken time off her very kind of high-powered job in a bank in London. And she, she was the first person that I interacted with. And she said, I've taken off two weeks holiday to do the most important walk of my life. And the first thing that people said in my office was, I hope you don't die. And this is when I realized how important it was that the message was delivered, that this isn't um, a conflict zone and this is a safe place to visit, and this is a humbling spiritual site. Um, I don't want there to be a narrative out there that um, people are, are risking their lives. Everyone's in it together, mm -hmm. you know? It's, yeah. it's safe. I implore more people to walk it. I know that some people are fearful of going there, and I, I can assure people it's... You encourage them? I really encourage people to go. I've met lots of parents whose children have gone first, and the parents have, I, I met a few last year who sort of said, I'm quite pleased I've done it now. But, you know, it's good to get it out there that it's a safe place to visit. So we just recorded this with Emily uh, before Arba'in, inshallah, you're going to get to watch it on the day of Arba'in. And we hope that while you're watching it, all the cast and crew along with Emily will be at Karbala. We'll be back after a short break. Welcome back, brothers and sisters. Here on Wilaya TV, we're with the lovely Miss Emily Garthwaite. 
And um, we were just talking about your trip to Kerbala during um, this last year's Arba'in, basically. So you landed at Najaf, right? Mm. Did you get to visit all, all the important cities in Iraq during that trip? Well, I've been in, uh, for, I've been in Najaf, in Baghdad, Kabbala, Kafal, Duanya. Um, I'm missing a very important one. I've seen and I've, I've visited a number of cities, but only during Arba'in. Um, I'm very, very keen to visit Basra and to have more time in Baghdad. Um, but that will continue, will, will have continued by the time this airs. I would have already been in Iraq for a number of months. Um, I think for me, the, the time during Arba'in is very, very specific. And what I want to see is what life is like in preparation for Arba'in. There should be more of a focus on the Iraqi communities who are supporting pilgrims as they walk. Some of these um, Iraqi communities are setting up, setting aside up to 20% of their annual income. And many of them are Sunni. This is something I feel hasn't been reported either. These communities have fought f in war for decades. And I had the privilege of meeting um, men who had returned home in 2018 after fighting for five years in the north and to see them hosting Arbaeen right was, after he got back right after they'd got back within months this is something that I really want to be seen because they are representing the message of Imam Hussein Iraqi communities are doing that and sometimes it can be forgotten because people are very focused on the destination I would implore people who have walked it to spend time speaking to mocap owners, to the people hosting them, asking them where they've come from, what their life has been like, because they are dedicating these 40 days and more to supporting and guiding pilgrims. We would be nowhere without them. True. What do you think drove them? What do you think inspired them? to do something like that. Like you said, it's like 20% of their annual income. And I think some of them really had rough lives. Yeah. And we are uh, like having trouble making ends meet. So what, what sparks it in them? I think it's something which people feel compelled to do. I think compelled is the, is the word. Um, it is an act of love for Sunni communities as well. It is an act of compassion and it's a unifying period of time. Um, Imam Hussein sort of goes beyond um, a lot of what we see in religion. He is quite unique in his message and what he's promoted more than anything is that we all uh, join together and, and a message of peace. So it makes sense to me why people would feel so inclined to, to take these enormous and compassionate steps to support people walking it. Um, okay, so what I want to know is, A, how did this trip help you with getting to know yourself better? Mm -hmm. And B, how did it help you with getting to know Imam Hussein? So I walked it first in 2017, and I'm sure that anyone who's watching who, when they first walk it, it's very overwhelming. Many people feel under an immense amount of pressure to feel and to be totally present, but we can't do that as human beings when we're so overwhelmed with the break of routine, the change of lifestyle temporarily. Um, I know that people have at times forced themselves to weep, to feel. Um, as someone who isn't Muslim, I felt that too. It's not just people who are Muslim when they're walking it. But when I returned in 2018, I knew what I was doing when I came back. I knew the routes I wanted to take. I like to go the rural routes and meet Iraqi communities. Um, and I knew that it was going to be emotionally demanding for me because whilst I'm walking it, I'm also documenting it and interviewing and managing social media and, and also trying to have my own personal experience mm -hmm. and finding a space for myself. Um, the second trip was, was life-changing for me. Um, yes, when it went viral, that was quite difficult. Many people, I'm sure, would love to be in that position. It's very, very challenging, and social media is something that there are many misconceptions about what it is to be in that position. I found that very difficult. 
especially as I had broadcasted something so personal to me. And I wanted to broadcast it because I wanted people to, to see that I was humbled and privileged to be in that position. I know that there are so many Muslims who would want to be in that position. And I felt so compelled to just, just to say thank you. And I wanted people to see it for themselves too, to share in it. Um, so did you feel like that's your way of saying thank you? Yeah, it was my way of saying thank you. Yeah, and it was nice because I got thousands of messages from people in like Kuwait or Syria or Pakistan who are at home and can't be there and got to walk it with me. And I don't think I ever fully understood the scale at which it would impact people. Um, so that was, that was very, I was uh, very emotional for a very long time. My mother picked me up from the airport and I must have held her for about five minutes. Yeah. Um, Emily, my dear, we're going to take a look at a little something that we're going to share with our viewer, with all our viewers, and, um, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, let's take a look at it together. I'm sure we're all going to enjoy this.
Um, first of all, mm -hmm. congratulations. Thank you. Um, I haven't watched that in a very long time. Could you walk me through it? Mm, so, the, the thing is, the most important moments for me were the quiet moments and the bits that no one saw, which is walking along the riverbank in Kaffel and the moon was coming up above the horizon and um, some of the moments in, you know, I stayed in a lot of homes because I went on the rural route, they don't really have mocaps, so you're just in their main bedroom with all the women and the children and those are the really special moments. That moment is so unimaginably like difficult to to understand and I battle with it every day I think about it every single day and uh, I am no closer to explaining it but I'm incredibly lucky to be in this position and I feel the weight of responsibility to um, represent a positive message regarding Islam and to keep integrity and authenticity in all I do. I've always made it very clear that I'm no authority on these matters, that I am merely the messenger. And I am so thankful to have been given the opportunity to present this message. And, uh, and I have very much, you know, um, dedicated my time to, to pursuing that. When I first went there in 2017, I never knew what was about to happen. And uh, it has shaped me in, in ways that are just extraordinary. It's been the making of me. Yeah. So did you have a guide through Karbala and the shrines? So a lot of it was through social media, um, the power of social media. And this was also a fantastic example of what happens when you really start to, to kind of share your world um, and on your terms. I never let anyone tell me what I should and shouldn't do. And I instinctively posted what I felt was fun and light. It's a very challenging walk and it's very emotionally demanding. And it was important that I shone a light on some of the more playful elements of it. The community and the joy and um, when you're in mocaps with the men or women. Um, and, and the little kids, they're so yeah, eager to see. And the children are absolutely gorgeous. So everything was driven through social media. Mm -hmm. I'm very, um, I prioritize responding to people a lot. So if someone invited me to their home, or someone wanted to speak to me for an interview, I would directly you know, message them. Um, I think that had a huge part to play. My guide, Farzan Nikpo, uh, has been uh, not only celebrated by me and, and is my second father, my Iranian father. Um, he's also not an official guide. Mm. And that's why it's so special, because we simply followed the power of positivity, call that our guide. We had no plan, no plan, no idea of where we would stay. And there's no better time to use the power of positivity than during our buy-in, because whatever happens, it's going to be all right. Someone will open their doors. Someone will feed you. Someone will give you tea. Someone will guide you. Um, and uh, you know, he's the most incredible companion. I think our message, our, our story is important. You know, Farzan is a married father, two children, Iranian and Muslim. And I'm non-Muslim, white British woman, but we have exactly the same mentality. We have something in common. We have something in common. Beautiful. I think we're very representative of what our buying should be. Did you ever think that it would become something so big like this? No, no. <clears throat> what was it for you at the beginning? Was this like, oh, I'm just going to go on a business trip, on a personal trip? It was a personal trip and a personal reason kind of brought me to, to our buying and I had messaged the first year was different, but the, the second time was quite a unique situation in which I contacted Farzan and felt that I really needed to, to go there. I wanted to walk it and I felt ashamed that I still hadn't walked it. And yet you can't experience it unless you, you walk it fully. 
um, I know Did you this. have any of those experiences that people constantly talk about, like blisters and sore muscles? No. Really? Nothing. I was really confused. No, I didn't have a single blister or sore muscle. Um, no, I had Did you uh, have trouble sleeping dancing? and eating? Yeah, I had trouble sleeping, but I was working and I, I normally sleep like a baby, but when I'm working, I, I don't sleep as much because I'm very focused. Um, no, but I mean, I would say you can bring your children to Arbaeen. There's loads of facilities available for disabled people too. It's welcome to all and um, it is a very accessible journey to take. I know that a lot of young mothers have asked me whether they think it's advisable. It's always going to be difficult with children. Absolutely. But during Arbaeen, the theme park. Yeah, but during Arbaeen, everyone helps. Um, and uh, I think it's a very important thing to do. And, and I, I'm so lucky to have been able to do it twice. I, I know so many people would uh, do so much to be there and I hope that everyone will have the chance. So when you first got there, was there someone to tell you that, okay, this is Bain al-Haramain, this is Abbas, this is Hussein, what happened, the history and stuff like that? Did Farzan. you have that happen? Really? Yeah, Farzan. He, Farzan is the most devout Shia Muslim. He represents everything that is good about the faith. Uh, I couldn't ask for, for a better guide. Um, he might not be official, he might not know everyone, but we didn't want that. I'm not about that. I don't want to come in as a member of press. I just want to do it on my own terms. And we did. And, uh, and I think it's a great example of what happens when things aren't contrived. It's, I didn't post it to, to to uh, get loads of exposure. I just posted it because I wanted to. I think if your intention is simple, then maybe these things end up happening. But if you're trying to deliver a message, it will get confused. So it's been a, it's been a big um, lesson for me to realize that I should keep doing what I'm doing. And um, I'm not trying to change people's minds. All I'm doing is showing people what I see. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe they'll see it too. Uh, life needn't be so complicated and uh, so judgmental. If everyone could just, just take the moment just to, to have a look at how others live um, without judgment and without applying their history, everything that they've come to be. You know, we're all on different journeys um, and it's, it's, we need, it's not about tolerance anymore. Tolerance isn't enough, inclusivity is what we need. You know, we can't just walk alongside each other. We need to actually talk. Mm -hmm. As I was watching this video, you, you had to like put in a lot of agility to be able to just crisscross among all those people and the, that crowd. And um, how, how was that? I mean, you got to go to places, like you said yourself, like the rooftop and the balconies and the corridors that many Muslims and Shias are dying to go to. Uh, what, what, did you go there like as a photographer? Did you go there as Emily? Did you go there as... Emily. Yeah? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it wasn't, um, I wasn't on a job. Mm. We just wanted to go there. There was no one backing it or anything. We just, we just decided to go. So um, it was very organic, but uh, that's the only time you really need to be agile during Arboyen is when you get to Kabla. <laughs> That's when you, you know, you always lose a few pounds when you're walking mm -hmm. and it's quite helpful when you're trying to <laughs> go through those small spaces. But um, to, be there on the, to be there on the eve of Arbaeen was incredibly moving to see everyone in their mocabs and people mourning. And uh, it was a very, very different experience than the following day. Um, I, I hope that everyone kind of gets to experience that. You need, you need to sit down and take it all in. And I think there's a, there's a kind of flu that you get afterwards as well, yes. <laughs> which um, all of my friends who walked it were all messaging each other from bed. Because I felt like it's such an emotional experience. You sort of, you need to take some time off afterwards just to, your body and your mind have to sort of calm itself again. Mm. It's a very cathartic experience, incredibly cathartic. You say that the eve of Arba'in, the whole atmosphere and the feeling, and well, what was it about it? Because like you've you've experienced a lot, like in your 25 years of fruitful life, and um, this somehow has 
has been really distinguished for you and it stands out in like among all the the rest of the experiences you've had i think in a in a, in a totally selfish part of it um it was the first time that a group of people and this was the iranian documentary film crew really trusted me to do my job and as a young woman i have encountered a number of the people or organizations who have perhaps not given me the same opportunity or have been patronizing at times and this was a moment when they said we know that you can do it and we believe in you and that was such an extraordinary feeling for it to come from a group of 15 Iranian men who'd never met me to have that much faith in my ability when we empower women it's amazing what they can do and I feel like for me this was my example if you lift me up I will fly mm. you know if you let me and um, so I'll always kind of associate it with my freedom as well, my freedom of expression and creativity, freedom to explore my faith and free from judgment. I could just do what I do best. Are you in any way glad that you got to practice this freedom from this sort of platform? Yes. Like Arba'in was, was how it manifested the best. Yeah, and people said to me, what an unlikely place to express your freedom. And I said, how interesting you think that's unlikely because it is in fact the safest I've ever felt as a woman and that that really surprises people and I can say that absolutely sincerely it is the safest I felt and the most supported and um, these sorts of things need to be out there in the open this is my personal experience I do not represent everyone who walks it but I have only encountered positive experiences okay so by the time this goes on air, you're already at Karbala, mm -hmm. right? You're already standing in front of his dome and that crowd and the sound of people chanting his name. And Abbas's shrine is on one side and Imam Hussein's shrine is on one side. What is Emily hoping to find on this trip? This trip? I want to to prioritize female stories. This, in 2018, 57% of the people that walked Albayin were women, and yet they, they aren't represented in a lot of the narratives I see online. A simple Google search, it looks like it's just men. So it's really important that we start looking at how Muslim women are walking independently or in groups these are safe spaces and that these women are empowered and they are walking to Imam Hussein. There is a narrative that exists that talks about the oppression of Muslim women. The antithesis to this is Arba'in and I want that to be delivered into a really public realm. I also want it to be more clear of the responsibility and the contribution women have made to Arba'in among Iraqi communities. Whilst men have been fighting in the north, they have been supporting that economy. They have been representing Iraq and they have been representing Arba'in. When I went in 2017, it was mostly Iraqi women, the men were away. So that's what I want to focus on. It's, it's time we look at that. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was an absolute pleasure having this chance, this opportunity to talk to you about such a wonderful topic. And thank you to all our viewers for tuning in, inshallah, this year. Emily, Zainab, our cameraman, our cast and crew, that gentleman that brought us water earlier, the people who are, who are in charge of uh, this little microphone that's in my ear, the director, the producer, the editor, and every other person, Muslim or non-Muslim, whose heart yearns for the son of Fatima. May we all find our way to the shrine of Aba Abdullah on this year's Arba'in. Thank you for being with us. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Mm.